Yeah, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Finell. And uh, this, of course, is uh, Think Tech with Aurelian Yorka, who uh, lives and works for Project Expedite Justice uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. He joins us from Geneva. Welcome to the show, Aurelian. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. So we're talking about trying to get the United Nations to deal with impunity. And I guess that that question assumes there is a fair amount of impunity going on in the world, and I, I sure agree. Um, and impunity leads to repetition, doesn't it? Uh, can you talk about what impunity we're talking about here? So we are talking about like um, how the Security Council, so one of the main organ of the United Nations, came to considering impunity as a threat to peace and security. Yeah, as we know, the Security Council is mandated by the UN Charter to deal with threat to peace and security in the world. And it started from, uh, let's say, a very strict, um, a very strict and restrictive um, um, approach on what is threat to peace and security to a much broader one. And uh, in, um, in 2006, it included uh, impunity as a threat to peace and security. So we that's that's one of the topics I wanted to, to discuss with you today. Yeah. Um, well uh, let me let me take my assumption to you, and that is impunity means impunity from um, investigation and prosecution of I'm just putting it together with Project Expedite Justice, uh, from investigation and prosecution of war crimes. And Lord knows you can quote me on this. We have plenty of war crimes in this world today, and the number of war crimes per capita per country seems to be increasing. So is that what we're talking about, impunity from uh, investigation and prosecution of war crimes? Exactly. It's about uh, violations of uh, human rights and uh, international humanitarian law. And um, as you said, uh, I think uh, it's an objective of the Council but uh, as we know today, the council is very limited in uh, its own capacities to uh, to be in a position to deal with international crisis. So it, the council has raised a lot of expectations when including um, fighting impunity and justice into one of um, the the reasons it would act and take decisions. But as we see the council status now, uh, it seems that we are uh, probably far away from that objective. You must have a very frustrating job, Aurelian. Right, yeah. Because, uh, you know, we talk about this, but uh, there's this strange relationship, which I would like you to tell us about, between the United Nations and the International Court. Um, <clears throat> um, and, um, oh, you know, what is happening with that? It doesn't sound like it's actually functioning. But my last information was that um, not a single prosecution had taken place with regard to what we all know happened in Bukha and other places in Ukraine. Um, and that uh, when the Israelis uh, submitted a war crimes complaint um, with regard to October 7th, uh, it, it wasn't even really accepted. Um, so uh, I I don't know if the United Nations has either the um, process um, or um, I guess the the facility to actually deal with war crimes that we in the world all around the world know have happened. What is wrong? Um, I'm, I may start first by the the word frustration that you used. Um, you, you might not know that I'm a, I'm a former I'm a former uh, police commanding officer and um, in and I'm a, actually an investigator. So when you talk about frustration, that's something that you learn very quickly to deal with when working with the police, because actually your job is to document, to arrest, to investigate. But your job is not. So you bring that people to justice, but your job is not to judge. So basically. You're part of it. You're part of this uh, uh, justice process, and frustration is about like the result, the outcome. It's about what's being done with all the evidence that you collected, with all the interviews that you conducted during all 
very long investigative process. It can be very long. And um, I, I actually, I watched um, also the discussion that you had with uh, Pascal Chirolan, who is a former ICC official. And I, I know that you asked him the same question. So uh, for my part, as an investigator part, I would say that frustration always exists because you're only part of a process. Well, I, this is a question I might hold until the end of our interview, but but given your comments, maybe I'll ask it right now. What what can be, what should be done? Um, you know, do we do we need to have another United Nations? Do we need to have another world war so another United Nations could come from the from the ashes and be more effective? Um, it's a very sad assumption, but I, I heard it many times. So um, that's. And I won't exclude it as a possibility, obviously, considering the, the, state of, the status of the, of the world today. But I would say um, from, let's say, my, my own experience, uh, I've been working uh, formally as a UN expert on sanctions for the UN Security Council for 12, 12 years. So I've seen the Security Council from my, again, my own perspective during all those years. And I'm not sure that we can change it because actually the UN is what the community of member states is. And we won't change that. I mean, like those countries are those countries, they are sovereign countries, and they are what they are. You can you can have this feeling, and I think it's normal because when you look at what's happening today, you you must have this feeling of. It, this is not this is not right, but then you can listen, dismantle the UN and and try try to start from ashes uh, something that may look better on paper, but at the end of the day, the, those members of that future uh, organization will still be member states, and those mem sovereign countries, those member states, you cannot change them. It's true. It's a reflection of the reality. What are we going to do about it? And uh, the problem is that, um, you know, when you have uh, at least two members of the Security Council who are going to veto everything that doesn't suit their their interests, uh, doesn't allow them to do mm, what they want to do, which could be very bad things, um, you lock it up. And so from a moral point of view, from the point of view of the UN Charter, you're stuck because of that. And uh, I don't know if the General Assembly has the power to change it. I kind of doubt it, uh, either legally or politically. It just can't do it. So the result is we have what we have. What do you? How do you say that in French? It is what it is. Uh, Sartre exactly. must. Sartre must have said something like that. <laughs> voilà, on a ce qu'on a. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, in French, in French, what you would say is you have what you deserve. And I think it comes back also to our nature as human beings. And that's probably part of us, uh, maybe that is also reflected at the higher level because we are just like humans being uh, uh, headed by other humans. Who, uh, we, we put them somehow in, in this position. So that's why on as commérite, as we say in French. Well, you know, I, what's interesting is that we, and including me, we think of the United Nations as uh, impeded uh, by the, you know, the rule of the Security Council. OK, so, you know, that Russia and China are not going to vote for anything that, you know, in interferes with their aspirations. Um, but there's another point, and I would like to ask you about it, is if you have this monumental failure of moral suasion, OK, at the Security Council, that affects the actions of the United States with regard to smaller countries, less influential countries, but countries that do have similar moral problems. And so, you know, what you what you get is not only decisions that favor China and Russia, you get decisions that are skewed about any place that has um, a moral issue. Am I right? Um, yeah, I think I think you're right. But um, again, um, the question is whether uh, these countries with a most, with a stronger, uh, maybe moral posture, uh, what legitimacy they would have 
to kind of impose their own moral to the rest of the world. And that's a question, that's an issue we always had at the UN. Uh, for example, in my, in my, in my own uh, situation as, as, as a national from a Western country, I've been always asked about like, why is your uh, perspective being uh, sort of imposed on, on, on others through Security Council decisions and resolutions? And that's a good question. And when you look at what what China um, is is planning for the future uh, to to shape the international community, they want to shape a community with different communities. Actually, uh, so there won't be one international community sharing the same values and share, sharing the same kind of uh, moral. But there will be several communities. Uh, and and uh, the the only let's say maybe the, the only common uh, um, that put all these communities together is the fact that we are living on the same planet. Uh, I want to turn to recent history, um, and um, you know the um, the fantastic action, not of the Security Council but the General Assembly, on uh, two resolutions. Uh, one resolution was to um, see, I don't think it ever got made. The resolution I'm thinking of was only hypothetical to to condemn um, Hamas for um, murdering 1,400 people and and maiming how many others. Um, the really, really brutal, murderous, um, completely unacceptable human conduct. Um, that was never condemned. Uh, either by the Security Council, which wouldn't anyway, because Russia is involved, um, but also by the General Assembly. And the representative of Israel stood up there and said, what's wrong, you people? How come you can't uh, do that? And now, you know, you, you want to you go for peace, essentially stopping Israel from defending itself. Because, you know, in his view, this is a long-term defense. We are defending ourselves by repetition of exactly the same thing. And uh, when uh, Hamas continues to fire rockets and uh, every day and continues to shoot at um, the, the Israelis and continues to hold the hostages as, as bait and, and its own people, the Palestinians as bait, um, you know, now you want peace. You want peace after you never condemned the original act. Uh, what's wrong with you people? And then Guterres gets up. <clears throat> And uh, he says, yeah, we need peace. We have to stop all this. Um, but he never said anything about the, the massacre. So, um, you know, what's wrong with this picture? I, I do not feel that Guterres is, is adequate here. I don't know about the rest of the General Assembly. Um, but I, I don't think the General Assembly has done the right thing or that it can be respected for mm, the ability to do the right thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm really wondering whether in the course of the last month, the United Nations has lost uh, more uh, influence and credibility around the world with right-thinking people who, who care about the future of humanity. Your thoughts? Um, I think what, you, what you're saying also illustrates um, a failure uh, from who has been kind of leading the international community since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's us. Uh, and I think the illustration uh, of this failure is the fact that nowadays there is no this kind of block of countries um, standing by uh, those values and, and role that, 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 that you mentioned uh, uh, earlier. And, and I think um, that reflects the fact that we fail in leading by example. And today, uh, I think that we are just kind of facing the consequences of, the, let's say, the, 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 the window of 30 years let's say 20 to 30 year, years that we had to, to, to lead by example, the, the, the rest of the world and the international community as a whole. And, and today we are just, I think in my opinion, just paying the consequences of, of, of that failure. Um, what we call the global South, and it includes a lot of democracies, it includes a lot of countries that 
you 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 believe, and uh, actually, when you visit these countries, you realize that they share the same values, but they are not following anymore. Uh, let's let's say the the Western countries in in those in those battles. You know, I don't know why, but uh, this conversation makes me think of Rwanda, um, where, where there was a, a legitimate genocide. You know, genocide is a word that's really used inappropriately. And we talk about, um, you know, the Israelis and uh, the Palestinians. It's not appropriate. It's a misuse of the term. But in the case of Rwanda, it was a legitimate genocide. They were, they were out there to kill each other. And um, what was um, remarkable about it is the United Nations had the blue helmets in Rwanda, um, but it didn't use the blue helmets. And there was only blue helmets. There was nothing beyond that. This would not have been the first and only time in, in, in Africa where that happened. Uh, there were other incidents where the uh, United Nations and the Blue Helmets were there, um, but they didn't do anything and they didn't use force at all. But my, you know, given the fragmentation of the world today um, on so many levels, I wonder if in a perfect world, the United Nations was um, capable of using force, that the blue helmets had blue rifles uh, and, they, and they could stop outrageous things uh, in the name of all nations. Wouldn't that be the way it should have worked, could have worked, might have worked in the future? Um, actually, in an ideal world, the United Nations would have its own blue helmets and do not rely on what we call TCC, which, which are true contributing countries. And actually in the UN Charter, the UN had its own force with air, uh, maritime and ground forces. They were all together uh, in, a, in a command, under the command of the, the chief of staff, of the, the military chief of staff of the UN. This is what we planned after the Second World War, because we were in a position to realize that we needed to have this, uh, let's say, peacekeeping force as neutral as possible and just uh, being under the command of the international community through their representatives at the Security Council. But actually, just two years after uh, 1947, this whole project plan fell apart because of already the the the, what we 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 named uh, afterwards the, the the Cold War, the opposition between the the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but we had this plan. We had this plan of having a neutral peacekeeping force able to to be deployed in in uh, in cases of of conflict uh, around the world. That's too bad, because you know if it had been if it had been permitted to proceed, it could have. Put out a lot of fires all these years, not necessarily fires where uh, the USSR was directly involved, but other fires elsewhere, other countries, small countries where terrible things were going on. You know, I'm thinking of the killing fields uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, and so many other places. So hmm, here's the problem, though. Right now, and, and you will have a better handle on this than me, right now there are a lot of hotspots Right now, there are a lot of places where, uh, you know, human rights are being violated in the most brutal way. It seems like it's the new, it's the new thing, and it is emerging. I don't, I don't have a handle on why. This, that's probably a, a geochemical answer to that, um, a biochemical answer to that. But we seem to have violations of human rights hither and yon in little countries and big countries on every single continent. I don't know why that is. Um, and so uh, Project Expedite Justice and lots of other NGOs, nonprofits around the world are, are doing what you're doing. You're investigating. You're talking to witnesses. You're documenting what's happening. Uh, the problem is um, you can document it. I mean, as lawyers like to document things in the hope that somewhere, sometime, somehow, they will be able to present all that evidence to a sympathetic judge or jury and get a, you know, a human response. Um, but it's harder now to get a human response. I know that Pro Project Expedite Justice has gone, for example, to France, uh, which has uh, allowed some, some litigation there. And, and that's a good thing. 
uh, where you know banks and other you know multinationals uh, have violated human rights or assisted others in violating human rights, and and France will hear the case. That's great, um, but in large part, um, the evidence that you collect, you you have you are only collecting it because you think somebody will ultimately listen. But the availability of somebody who will listen seems to be diminishing too. And the United, United Nations is not one of those places. Uh, maybe it's individual members of universal jurisdiction. Um, maybe it's um, some other place which arguably has jurisdiction over the violator. Um, when you collect evidence, Aurelian, um, and you, you know, fill up your trial book, so to speak, with the uh, witnesses and legal briefs and what have you, who in your mind are you doing it for? Mm, very good question. And I think when you do it, when you document, when you, you collect all those evidences, actually you don't know um, what will be the final, if there is the final user of, of this, uh, this uh, judicial process, procedure. So you do it because as an investigator, you just, this is the way you uh, contribute to, to, let's say, uh, a greater good. Uh, like it's, it's a kind of um, humanity uh, philosophy. And this is something that you want, that's going to be your contribution to, to, to the world. So basically, you do it as as you apply your 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 methodology because you know that if you don't, whatever you do will be useless. So um, that's the, I would say that's just something, and again, that's going to be your contribution, and you have done your part of the job, and you do not uh, you don't have to be frustrated because. Uh, you know that part of it will be probably useless and will, will not end in any in any judicial proceeding. So I think that's yeah that's something again that has to do with frustration as you mentioned earlier. But if I may just come back to your first comment on why we have all this crisis popping up or, um, in so many different places, I think that maybe one of the difference is in in the past we have some kind of major, uh, let's say, uh, powers that would uh, uh, fight each other, what we call, uh, again, the, the Cold War. And after um, in the collapse of the Soviet Union, we, we started to, again, have these residual conflicts. And then we would have, um, let's say, a kind of common, a shared view on what, what we should do. And uh, this is where the UN deployed the most, uh, num the, the, the greatest number of, of peacekeepers. This is where the, 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 the sanctioned regimes also were implemented. And, and, and actually, even in that context, uh, we were not able to solve all this crisis, even without that global competition that was not there anymore. Actually, uh, the example that you gave uh, about the, the Genocide in Rwanda is a very good example because there was no global competition in 1994 when it happened. So there was no political diplomatic reason why we 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 would fail in 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 that in that context. So again, are we designed to fail somehow, or is it something that uh, cannot work in 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 different contexts? Uh, so that's that's a I think that's a good question. Also, we we should uh, ask ourselves. Yeah, you know, um, again, what comes to mind here in this conversation is what happens if the United Nations is um, is ineffective in dealing with conflict and dealing with crimes? Um, then people take it in, people meaning countries, take it into their own hands because, the, you know, they, they could be really ticked off or they could feel that unless we do something about this, it'll happen again and we cannot afford to have it happen again. And I'm thinking of um, the uh, uh, the Adolf Eichmann kidnapping. Was it in Argentina? I don't remember for sure. Uh, where they brought him back and, and made him stand trial in Israel. Um, that was not with the blessing of the United Nations or any other international organization. Um, and, uh, you know, there were, uh, oh, yeah, 
After the murders in the Munich Olympics, uh, the Israelis went out there and assassinated every or nearly every terrorist who had been involved in those. And again, the, the purpose was not so much vengeance as it was, we don't want this to happen again. You can't do this. We're, we're, we're giving you guardrails. We, we are not going to permit you to do this. And if you do this, this is what happens to you. Uh, again, without any blessing by the United Nations or any other multinational organization. And so I say to I say to myself, and, and you could say, I mean, this is really perverse, but you could say that Vladimir Putin is doing to Ukraine because uh, he, he thinks he needs to take matters into his own hands and attack a neighbor. Um, and there's nobody he can go to to settle his um, you know, score, to settle his beef. Uh, on the other hand, the flip side of that is uh, China and the South China Sea. Um, it went to the international court. And uh, the international court ruled against China. China, was, China didn't even show up, even though China was a party to that agreement, the law of the sea. And, and uh, at the end of the day, um, China has ignored the ruling of the international court on jurisdiction in the, in the South China Sea. So I think what you have, and, and it's part of the same thing, isn't it? You know, we, we like you until you disagree with us, and then we're going to do whatever we want. Uh, meaning that the United Nations and its accessory organizations don't don't really have the clout to make its own rulings happen or um, to have people call upon it, right, to deal with this impunity problem, uh, to deal with um, people who um, are, you know, do, do not have acceptable values. So I say to myself, you know, as as we go forward here, you have these various instances. I haven't listed them all. Uh, where the United Nations, because it's not doing anything, is actually allowing other people to take matters into their own hands. This is not a good thing. Um, you know, Jane, in theory, um, when you're part of a community, you follow the rules. So international law is based on consent. So this is, those are the limits to the use of force, but actually those limits um, the only way to have it uh, um, respected, you know, uh, the, only, the only reason why states comply with those limits and with international law is because it's, it's because they are part of this community. So that's the thing with the UN. We believe that the UN should be the kind of the, 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 the enforcement uh, force or the kind of sheriff of the, of the world to enforce international law. But actually, that's, that's not the way it should be. The way it should be is that all the member states of this community should abide by the rules because they belong to that community. And this is where actually the UN role is somehow a bit, uh, let's say, mis misunderstood in a way because we expect from the UN to do something that it cannot do. Because again, and we come back to... Uh, how this, this, this discussion started. Again, the UN is what member states are. And uh, that's, yeah, that's something we cannot change. So um, you think it'd be okay if I made a suggestion? Of course, that's your show. <laughs> no, no, but I'm making a suggestion for your, for your reaction, of course. So you know, in the in the first uh, days, and in, uh, and when anything happened in, in Gaza, um, Hamas would be right, right, ready, immediately ready to make you know international statements about how the, their people had been abused and this and that, and uh, they succeeded. I mean, for example, in the case of the hospital, or the parking lot two weeks ago, um, they they misstated it completely, but they they. They immediately made their statement globally, and everybody everybody thought it was the fault of the Israelis when in fact it wasn't. It was the Islamic Jihad that blew up the parking lot in the hospital and killed all those people. And so you say, hmm, for, first to the media uh, is 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 a real important thing, and Hamas understands that. It understands about propaganda and getting to the media right away and and setting it up so that people are sympathetic. Um, and that has resulted in enormous uh, and, and inappropriate, uh, often inappropriate protests around the world, everywhere. 
Uh, sometimes those protests have been spontaneous, but I, I suggest to you other times they have not been spontaneous and that terrorist money has generated the protest because that works for the terrorists. <clears throat> but here, um, just this week, this week is fresh. And the Israelis have started to stream on YouTube interviews of the families and friends of those who were massacred. And they didn't do it before. And it's a cultural thing. They, they don't like talking about the dead. They don't like, you know, um, showing you dead bodies and parts of bodies and that sort of thing. And, and even now they're reluctant to do that. But at least now what's happening is the Israelis are giving you interviews with people who were wounded or who, who were in, in, in danger of being killed or whose friends and family and children were killed. So say, well, that's, that's good because they're catching up maybe to the public relations campaign of Hamas, which has been showing you people in Gaza that have been wounded or whatever, hurt, um, you know, for weeks. And I say to myself, good, but they're late. Primacy is everything. Okay, now you have, you have this trial book under your arm, and it's full of witness interviews and probably a lot of video interviews and legal briefs and what have you, making the case, um, wherever this may happen, that there are war crimes going on, atrocities, uh, violations of uh, human rights, um, and you're keeping it under your arm. You're waiting for a moment. I, I'm not referring specifically to you or Project Expedite Justice. I'm talking about investiga investigatory bodies, whatever NGOs or nonprofits you know might be involved. Um, you have all this information, but you are reluctant to share it, as the Israelis have been reluctant to share it with the world. Instead, you get the, this myopic um, view of Guterres, who I don't think he understands. I don't think he's good at this. Um, and and what, what the problem is, not only can you not present it to a trier of fact, a judge or a jury, in, at least in the foreseeable future, um, but the world never hears about it because you're reluctant to put it out there. And I suggest to you that maybe what the United Nations should do and investigative organizations like Project Expedite Justice and others should do is put it out there and um, not worry about, um, you know, offending people's sensibilities. Just tell them the truth. Um, why don't you do that? Why doesn't the United Nations do that? Actually, well, what, what the example you're giving is, uh, is a very good example. It's a very good illustration of, again, uh, frustration. But that frustration is more related to time because justice takes time. And before justice uh, is, is done, you have that investigation phase, which also takes time. And actually, when you look at uh, the time that people is now giving to what's happening, it's live. So basically, we have a live interest uh, in events on what's happening. Uh, so that's why you get all this fake news propaganda spreading because actually we do scroll on, on, on a cell phone, on a smartphone looking for news and we won't take the time to, uh, to read about facts, to read about um, uh, what, what could be the truth. So that's, that, that's a very good example. But even, let's say, if Project Expedite Justice had an a Israel-Palestine program, even if we would, you, you, you start documenting on the spot, meaning you have access, you have uh, the capacity to conduct the interviews uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in good conditions, even if you could do that investigative work um, and you start documenting, you do this fact-finding exercise, which is an investigation, uh, per definition. So then you collect all those evidences, and then you still need to bring that to a judge, to a justice court that will be the only one in a position to, uh, to decide what could be the uh, truth, again, from that justice perspective. So it takes time. It's a very long process, and it's against the uh, today the need of having 
uh, information uh, immediately, all the time. On you, you, you see how we can switch from one conflict to the other. Uh, it looks like uh, these, these conflicts were happening in the past. You know, it would take years and years uh, before getting pe people before losing people's interest in that conflict. Now it seems that it can, it can move very fast of switching attention from one conflict to the other. And that won't change the time that you need to bring people to, to court and to investigate and to, to establish uh, a, a truth. Perhaps too bad, because um, in, in the case of Donald Trump uh, versus Jack Smith, uh, Smith never talks about his evidence. Uh, Donald Trump you know, gives you his mm, perverse view of, of, of the evidence and criticizes uh, the institutions, and he does that immediately. And so the impression uh, on the judge, the jury, and the public is coming from Donald Trump, not from Jack Smith. And so, um, you know, time is of the essence, I would suggest, even though it takes a while to investigate. Anyway, so we're, we're about out of time, uh, uh, Arlene. Already, we're about out of time, Arianne, and and I wonder if you have any closing comments you want to make about about what we've been discussing. Um, actually, yes, because uh, if if you don't mind, uh, the initial topic I want to discuss was about like how you can fight immunity with UN sanctions, and sanctions are a tool which is different from justice. Sanctions, it's a political decision which is taken by the Security Council. In, within a regime that he creates. And it's much more flexible and it's much more, let's say, responsive. So that's why it's a different way to approach uh, fighting impunity compared to international justice or the International Criminal Court. But maybe that's gonna be another discussion we, we could have in the, in the near future. Yeah, I'd like to do that because I think sanctions is an art form and it's very easy to do sanctions that don't have an effect. So we have to refine and um, you know, create nuanced sanctions that actually do have an effect where we can bring everybody together to join as one voice on the sanctions. Uh, that's another conversation. Uh, well, thank you, Aurelian. I really appreciate thank the discussion. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jake. Aloha. A tout à l'heure. A bientôt. A bientôt.